Thank you guys for joining us for number four of four for our NDSU Extension Horse Management webinars. Uh, we're really excited to have you with us this spring, and we just appreciate you following along. Um, today, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat or in the Q&A, um, and Paige and Rachel will be monitoring that. And so um, we have a treat for you today. We have Dr. Carrie Hammer joining us today, and uh, Carrie's going to talk about um, equine genetic disease overview, specifically uh, in quarter horses. And so this is something that as a group you guys have asked for pretty much since we started these in 2020. And so um, it fit what we were doing this year. And so we're really excited to have Dr. Hammer with us. Uh, with that, we'll hand it over and we'll get started. All right. Thank you, Mary. Excited to see everyone on today and excited to talk about genetic diseases um, it's one of the things that I have a real interest in and I enjoy talking about it. So hopefully we'll be able to provide you all uh, with a little information and a few things to learn about these diseases and how they might affect our horses. To get started, I have a few slides with just some basic genetic info. Um, one of the big things about genetics, it likes to have a lot of difficult terms that are sometimes unfamiliar to people and it loves to use lots of acronyms. So we'll try to talk through that and at least make sure everybody's on the same page. In terms of our horses, we're dealing with about 22,000 different genes. So huge genome in our horse. And there's just a few that we know lots of information about. Every horse, if you remember back, from your basic biology classes, some of you that might have been a few years ago, some of you that might have been many years ago, um, and talking through basic biology, every animal gets two copies of every gene. So they're getting one of those genes from their mother or their dam and one of those genes from their father, so the stallion and their sire. If those genes are the same, so they get the same basic DNA sequence. So DNA uh, is a long-term deox... I'm not going to say it because I don't want to confuse you. Um, but that stands for the genetic material, right, that's inside the cell. If that DNA sequence is the same, so they get the same sequence from their dam as they get from their sire, we say that they are homozygous for that gene. We'll talk about, I may use that term every now and then, homozygous and heterozygous. Heterozygous just means that that DNA sequence is different. So they got a different sequence pattern um, from one parent compared to the other. And that tells us a lot, especially in terms of these genetic diseases that will influence how these diseases might manifest, whether the, those two copies are the same or whether they're different. The other thing when we talk about genetic diseases that comes into play is how many genes are influencing that disease. The diseases that we are going to talk about today for the most part are all single gene diseases. So that means that there is a mutation within just one gene and they're inherited in a very simple pattern and it's called a Mendelian pattern. It has to do with um, kind of how those genes cross and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we usually refer to these as either dominant traits, recessive traits, or sex-linked traits. The opposite of the single gene diseases then is multiple gene diseases, sometimes called polygenic. And it just means that there's multiple genes, poly meaning many, so multiple genes, and those genes are also influenced by the environment. So those are much harder to track, um, much harder to know about, but these would be diseases that we know has some sort of genetic link, but it's not so simple that we can just identify that gene right off. So equine metabolic disease is an example of a multiple gene disease. Um, equine asthma is another one that is considered a multiple gene disease. Osteochondrosis desiccans, OCD, one of our bone development diseases, another one. And so usually there is some nutrition component or age component along with the multiple genes that are influencing that disease. And again, those are much harder to identify, much harder to track. Um, and so that's why we don't have a lot of good genetic tests for those types of diseases. 
So again, today we're gonna be focusing on single gene diseases with a little bit of an exception for one of them that we're gonna talk about. Okay, so I said that the single gene diseases we usually refer to as dominant or recessive. So dominant means, just like it sounds, that gene is dominant, so you only need one copy of the gene. You can get the mutated disease gene from either the foal's dad or from their mom. So it can come from the stallion or it can come from the dam, but they only need one copy of that diseased gene for the offspring to be affected. The opposite of that is a recessive disease where you'd need two copies. So you that foal will need to get the diseased mutated gene from each parent in order for them to be affected. If they only get one copy, we usually talk about them and use the term carrier. So they're a carrier animal. They carry a copy of that uh, mutated diseased gene, but they don't show the disease themselves. So they're not affected with the disease and that's recessive. Okay, we don't have carrier animals in a dominant disease state because if they get the gene, they have the disease. So that's the difference between those two. The other one that is a single disease um, possibility are sex linked diseases. And that means that that mutated gene is either linked to an X or the Y chromosome. So either female related if it's an XX or uh, male related if it's showing up on just either one X or on the Y chromosome. The diseases we're talking about today, there are none of them that are sex linked that we will be talking about. Okay, so this is where it gets a little confusing, um, but that Mendelian genetics, we're gonna bring back the uh, Punnett square, those of you that maybe remember that from your biology class. But we'll talk about how the diseases are transmitted, starting with dominant diseases. And so in this example, let me get my little pen up. Oh, look, I can make it thicker. Ha, just figured how to do that. Okay. If we are dealing with the stallion, we have some options. So NN, is our designation usually for the normal gene. So it has a copy of the normal non-disease gene. Remember they have two copies of each gene, okay? In this example, they have one diseased gene, the D and one normal gene. This one, they have both copies of the diseased gene. The mare, we have the same possibilities. So she can be normal in both of the genes, she could have one copy of the diseased gene, or she could have both copies of the diseased gene. In a dominant trait, if they have one copy or both copies, they would show signs of the disease. And what this little square does, is shows you the risk of the transmission of the diseased gene to their offspring. So a stallion that has one copy of the gene if he is mated to a mare that has no copies of the disease gene, it's a 50-50 chance that the baby would have the disease, okay? If you mate a horse that has one copy of the disease gene with a mare that has one copy of the disease gene, there's a 75% chance, okay? If both the stallion and the mare have both copies of the disease, 100% chance the baby's gonna have it. So that's the dominant disease. It changes a little bit for a recessive disease. Okay, so this one, remember, in a recessive disease, the offspring has to have both copies of the disease gene for them to be affected. So in that case, if you have a stallion and a mare that are crossed that both have both copies of the disease gene, 100% of the foals will be affected, okay? 
And I just wanted to point out this difference. These charts are going to come back as we start to talk about specific diseases, but I wanted to have these up here to let you kind of think about in terms of um, mating stallions and mares and the risk of that showing up in the foal. And that's one of the reasons why um, the Quarter Horse Association requires some of these tests for breeding animals is to help owners be able to figure out those risks that may occur for their offspring to have the diseases. I should have mentioned at the start, I don't remember if Mary mentioned that right off, but if you have questions kind of as we're going along, some terminology that didn't make sense, oh, I see Paige put it into the chat box, please drop those questions in the chat. Um, don't be afraid, I'll try and hit on them if I see them as we're going and they can nudge me too to make sure I can answer that kind of as we're going along if there's something that isn't making sense. Because like I said, genetics can be confusing, especially if it's been a while since you've dealt with some of this um, crossing and genes terminology. Okay, oops, let me clear those off of there. So we're gonna talk about the six diseases. Um, it's called the five plus panel, which really is a six panel disease. Um, but there are six diseases that are tested for with the Quarter Association genetic test, glycogen branching enzyme disorder, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, polysaccharide storage myopathy, malignant hypothermia, um, hereditary equine regional dermal asthenia, and myosin heavy chain myopathy. They are horrible names. There is a reason why they all have acronyms because they're super long, medical, and hard to say. So we're gonna start with the first one, which is glycogen branching enzyme deficiency. This is a disease that causes late term abortions and death of foals. So its main claim to fame is this is a mutation or a genetic defect in the protein that the horse needs to build and store glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of glucose or the fuel that the horse needs. So that fuel they need to fuel their muscle, their heart muscles, their brain, that sugar glucose is stored as glycogen. And these horses that have this defect can't store that properly. And so what happens is you see abortions or stillbirths. You may have a foal that is born, but it's extremely weak and it can't get up well, especially if the foal's on its side, it can't roll to be sternal because that takes extra energy, extra fuel in its muscles to do that. They can have a really low body temperature. They have a lot of trouble maintaining their body temperature, um, high respiration rates, sudden death, contracted tendons, um, but it is a fatal disease. So that ability to be able to use glycogen and get that sugar that they need to fuel their muscles and fuel their brain and fuel their heart is extremely important. And to date, those foals have not survived. Prevalence in the quarter horse um, industry or the quarter horse field is about eight to 10%. Now I have these prevalences in here for each of these. They can vary a little bit depending on which report you're reading. And I'll try and talk about that and some of the controversial ones, but in general, about eight to 10% is what we're seeing. Um, it is a recessive trait. So that means that for those foals to be affected, they need to get one copy from each parent. So they need a copy of the defective gene from each parent. So in this case, right, if you have a mare that doesn't have a copy of the gene and you have a stallion that doesn't have a copy of that gene, you will never, ever make a foal that has this disease, okay? So that's kind of what obviously most breeders would be hoping for. When it is reported as a result on the report, when you do a genetic um, test on these animals, the results come back looking like this, uh, NN for the normal gene, the disease gene is listed as GBED, so the abbreviation for glycogen branching enzyme deficiency. And obviously this one, a double positive would have both copies of the diseased gene. 
So again, if you have a horse that has neither copy, you will never have a foal that has this disease because it's recessive. They've got to get a copy from each parent to show symptoms of the disease. All right. The next one, hereditary equine regional dermal asthenia, HERDA. So hereditary equine regional dermal asthenia, HERDA, is a disease that affects the horse's skin. So in this case, there's a mutation that deals with collagen formation. So collagen, there are parts of collagen that holds the skin, the outer layer of skin down to the under layer of skin. And because that isn't formed right, there's basically a shifting of the upper layer of skin and it can separate from the bottom layer of skin. What you see in these horses is this super stretchy skin. Um, so the picture on the left, these are pictures from the University of California, Davis. It looks like that horse was pinched. So like you pinch their skin and it stays like that. So that's one of those tests we often use for dehydration, right? Pinch their skin and it should snap back to flat again. And these horses, when you pinch it, it stays tented and pinched like that. You can also see these ulcerations, especially along the back where the saddle might rub, where the skin is basically separated from that underlayer and you have an open oozing sore. You can get fluid and um, kind of pockets underneath the skin in those separated place. The wounds heal really slowly in these horses, and you can also get a lot of scarring. So even when the skin heals back, it tends not to heal back quite correctly in the same. So you get a lot of scarring that forms as those horses are healing. For this disease, the prevalence is estimated at 3.5%. There tends to be an increased um, prevalence among the cutting horse lines. So we'll notice that as we talk through these diseases, there are certain lines of diseases that it tends to be more prevalent. And that is because some of our genetic diseases show up more frequently with inbreeding and line breeding. So line breeding is a form of inbreeding. It's just a little more removed, um, but that tends to concentrate certain genes. And so then we'll tend to see those diseases more frequently. And in this case, these tend to show up a little more frequently in our cutting horse lines. Carrie? Yeah. There is a question in the box um, on when we have the results NN or N herd. Um, do you know if it's the mare gene listed first or the stallion gene listed first, or is that not identified? It usually isn't identified. It is, it is, if it, if there is a normal gene, it's almost always listed first. That's just kind of, um, I guess, historical practice, I guess. So they'll, they'll always list the normal gene first and the disease, disease, disease gene second, or at least that's typical. Good question. Thank you. So HERDA is a recessive gene, just like the first one. Oops, these like to be a little touchy. Um, so the first two diseases we talked about, uh, GBED, so the glycogen branching enzyme deficiency was recessive. This one, HERDA is also recessive. So that means those foals or any horse to be affected has to get both copies of the mutated gene for them to be affected. So again, they have to have both copies. So the first recessive disease we talked about, those foals don't survive. So they don't live into adulthood. Herda, so these horses, they can have a copy um, and both copies of that affected gene. They will show clinical signs, um, but they can live, right? It affects the skin. Often out of convenience, owners tend to euthanize these horses just because it becomes very difficult to ride them. So a lot of owners, you won't even know that these horses are affected until you start riding them, putting tack on them as the saddles, you know, shift and cause friction along the skin of the back. You start to get these open sores, these ulcers that won't heal. Um, so if you don't mind having a horse that you can't re ride or do a lot with, um, Functionally, these horses can survive, but a lot of times um, from a performance standpoint, they have trouble 
um, performing and writing and just because the friction of the tack will cause, cause those skin lesions. Now, however, having said that, um, I definitely know of horses that have both copies of the gene. They are affected um, and I have seen them be ridden, right? So some horses definitely have more severely affected cases than others, but the horses that I do know that were being ridden still had problems with reoccurring sores. They took a long time to heal and those owners had to be really careful with saddle fit um, and the padding under the saddles. So it, it's not always a death sentence for these horses if they have both copies of the gene, um, but they can have a much more difficult life, especially if they're supposed to be a performance animal. All right, the next one on the list, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, better known as HYPP. This is one of the first genetic diseases that was ever discovered in horses. And so we tend to know a lot more about this disease than we know about some of the others. This disease causes a disruption in muscle contraction. So the genetic mutation is in the gene that regulates the sodium channel in muscle. And so because of that, um, that sodium channel doesn't work correctly and the muscles are much more prone to contraction. So if we think of horses that tie up, that's some of the symptoms that you might see in these horses because those muscles will contract. You may just see some muscle tremors. The horses may have weakness or it could be so severe that they have paralysis, collapse in their stalls and even sudden death, especially if the heart muscle is affected or the respiratory muscles. So the diaphragm, if it's affected and not contracting properly, obviously those horses have trouble breathing or the heart has trouble contracting. This is one, now we're moving into the dominant traits. So prevalence wise, about 4% in the horse population, and this is the quarter horse population again, but when we look along a specific line, it is more prevalent in halter horses. And that's because it is linked to a very, um, what well, was a very famous halter horse. Now he's very famous for the start of this disease, um, but his name was impressive. And it should be noted that the disease actually, as far as they can tell, started with him as just a um, random mutation. So genes are always having some random mutations. Most of the times those embryos don't survive or it's not something that's severe. So this was an odd one. It was just a random mutation, but it was in such a way that those horses could survive. So it started with him, but it wasn't because he was super inbred or had some other issue. He actually had um, what was sought after at the time, some amazing muscling for those halter horses. Um, but he just happened to be the one that had this weird mutation and was the start of this. So it's a dominant disease. And if remember the dominant diseases only need one copy of that disease or one copy of the gene to show the disease. And so in this case, anytime you breed an animal that has one copy of the gene, you have a 50% risk of that animal getting the disease, okay? So even though um, there's only one copy of the gene, there's a 50% chance they will pass that on and they themselves can be affected. So it only takes one gene for him to be affected. I noticed there was a question, if a horse is tied up, does it have HYPP? And that answer is no. So there are a lot of things that can cause a horse to tie up. Some of it could be a genetic disease and some of it can completely not be related to genetics at all. And it can be related to nutrition, electrolytes, um, environment. So that's a tough one because a lot of these diseases, and we're gonna talk about several that are muscle related, their symptoms can look a lot the same. And that's one of the real importance, um, important reasons to have this genetic testing done is because you can figure out whether those tying up issues are due to one of the genetic diseases or maybe they're due to something else. So again, started with impressive, it's more prevalent in halter horses. You only need one copy of this gene because it's dominant for those horses to have symptoms. In general, 
Horses that have both copies of the gene, so they're homozygous, they have two copies of the disease gene. So these guys here that are doubles um, are usually more severely affected. Okay, but that's not always true. So the ones with one copy of the gene usually less severely affected than the horses that have two copies of the gene, but there is a huge wide variation with this disease. There are horses that have copies of the HYPP gene, but the owners have never seen symptoms. So sometimes the symptoms can be really mild, just a little twitching maybe of their eyelid. And sometimes, as I mentioned on the first side, they can be so severe that the horse is, is per paralyzed in their stall. And a lot of this is because this is a disease that is greatly affected by nutrition. So how the sodium regulates through those muscles um, is influenced by potassium. And so how much potassium is in the diet can greatly affect these horses. So there is a lot of variation, but in general, double copies, more affected um, individual horses. And I know I'm running through a lot of these diseases relatively quickly. That's one thing I should talk about. Um, I'm trying to give you all an overview on all of these genetic diseases, kind of why they're important, what's different about them. Um, but we're not gonna have time to go into all the specifics of each individual disease in terms of treatment, how to care for them. There's lots of different things that can be done um, to manage some of these animals in terms of their nutrition, in terms of their exercise regimens, how they're housed, the environments they're in. Um, and those aren't things that we're gonna address today because they're so individualized, depending on the horse, depending on the disease, depending on the environment. Um, those would be things that you'd have to talk either with your local extension agents, your veterinarians, um, get that information that you need to make those decisions. But today I'll try to hit those overviews so at least you have some info to be able to um, make and talk about those decisions if you need to. So malignant hyperthermia, actually one name that's not super long. So MH, malignant hyperthermia. This one is a disease that causes um, muscle contraction, and it has to do with the mutation that changes the amount of calcium inside muscle cells. So you can see that there's a lot of this that deals with um, muscles. That's important to our performance horses. So that's where we tend to see a lot of these diseases when they're not performing correctly. Um, so it changes calcium inside the muscle cell, and it basically triggers this super hypermetabolic state. Um, so it causes this increased muscle metabolism. It tends to be triggered by anesthetic drugs. Um, so certain drugs that you give the horse will trigger these outbursts. Occasionally it can also be triggered by stress or excitement of the animal. Um, so it's usually not associated with exercise. So we'll talk about some others that are, are associated with exercise. This one's usually not associated with exercise. Um, stress, excitement, anesthetic drugs will do it. But again, this kind of shows up those signs similar to tying up. So you get these stiff, really rigid muscles, high heart rates, irregular heart rates, um, super high body temperature can be 104 and higher and sweating and even death if it's not able to be um, corrected. And so, right, these horses overheat, um, basically they are suffering from heat stroke as those muscles contract and generate this increased heat. So they can die from this, um, but if we know that we're dealing with it, um, you can kind of avoid the situations as much as possible that might trigger it. And so we kind of gave you a preview of this slide, but it is a dominant trait. Prevalence on this one is unknown at the moment. So they haven't done some good studies to know the prevalence um, in the quarter horse industry, but we do know it tends to be more common in halter horse bloodlines. And this one does tend to tie along with polysaccharide storage myopathy that we'll talk about in a minute. So those two, sometimes the horses can have both genes and then they definitely are more severely affected. But again, it's dominant. So they only need one copy of that trait um, one copy of that mutated gene to show symptoms. 
So I mentioned that one is very similar, kind of this polysaccharide storage myopathy. And so polysaccharide storage myopathy, PSSM, and specifically PSSM type one. So this causes abnormal storage of sugar in muscle. If you remember, when we started this, we talked about glycogen branching enzyme disorder, glycogen branching enzyme disease, GBED, which also deals with abnormal storage or abnormal glycogen formation in muscle. This is deals with some of the same components, but it's a totally different gene and a totally different mutation. So GBED, recessive, the horses as foals don't survive. Polysaccharide storage myopathy, this is a recessive disease um, or a dominant disease, sorry about that, dominant disease, and these horses do survive. They can survive and perform, um, they just need a little extra care. But again, we see these signs of tying up. So the glycogen as it's made, which is the storage of our fuel and muscle, it, it kind of accumulates and basically plugs up those muscles and they can't get to that fuel and that sugar the way they need to. And so it causes some muscle damage as they're trying to access that sugar and fuel. So they sh show signs of tying up. The muscles get stiff, they get hard, the horses sweat, it's painful, they don't wanna move and they don't perform the way you would expect them to. Um, so basically it's like, after you've had a Charlie horse, those of you that have had that, a severe muscle cramp in your calf, and then you try to go run, you don't really run as well as you should. And so those horses don't perform, owners report that they're not performing the way they would expect them to. Signs can be super frequent and severe to hardly at all. So huge range here again is how severely those horses are affected. Now I mentioned that this is PSSM1. So this is testing for a very specific form of polysaccharide storage myopathy. Um, and as they've kind of worked through this and, and done more testing, we've learned that there are some other forms to this polysaccharide storage myopathy. Um, and that tends to be deemed PSSM2, okay? So there are other forms um, and the test that we have only tests for this PSSM1. So horses that tie up that don't have PSSM1 doesn't mean that they don't have um, some other sort of genetic disease of that muscle, but we can't do it with the genetic diseases testing that we have. And so those need to be tested for with a muscle biopsy. And that's the only way to kind of differentiate these other forms of polysaccharide storage myopathy. And we know that, I think the estimates are that about 25% of the quarter horse population that has tying up doesn't have PSSM1. They have some other form of the polysaccharide storage myopathy. So they can tell from the biopsy that it is a polysaccharide storage myopathy, but it's not the same gene that we have this genetic test for. So prevalence, 11%. Um, so relatively common, um, and again, dominant trait. So the horse only needs one copy of the gene to be affected. And again, um, similar to HYPP horses that have two copies. So the homozygous, they got a copy from each parent tend to be more severely affected than the horses that are the heterozygous ones that only have one copy. They only got one copy of the disease gene from their parent. And just like with HYPP, a huge range. So horses with polysaccharide storage myopathy can, how severely they show symptoms, how frequently they tie up, can greatly be affected uh, by their diet, by their environment, kind of how their, um, what the husbandry is for those animals. All right, and the number six in the big list of diseases is the newest, myosin heavy chain myopathy, MYHM. So myosin heavy chain myopathy. This originally, when it was first found, was called immune-mediated myositis. So the gene test was originally IMM, immune-mediated myositis. We've now learned that there's two basic clinical presentations, but it's all related to one change in a gene. Um, and so it's this 
myosin heavy chain gene that is mutated in these animals, but you get two different clinical presentations. This immune mediated myositis, so basically immune system um, damage to muscle, but you also have non-exertional rhabdomyolysis. So this is tying up, but not related to exercise. So muscle damage, lysis of the muscle cells, not related to exercise, which is different than recurrent exercise related rhabdomyolysis, which is a different disease. I'm not talking about today. It's not as common in um, quarter horses. So these both lead to muscle damage. They're both caused by the same um, mutated gene, but they're just two different clinical presentations. One causes very, very severe muscle atrophy. So the muscle basically disintegrates, goes away. And the other one, it's less severe. There's severe muscle damage, but you don't have the same atrophy where it just kind of is lost. The muscle mass is lost. So the horses show signs of tying up. They're stiff, they're weak. Um, and you get this rapid loss of the muscle mass, especially the gluteal muscles, so the hip muscles and the muscles along the back. Prevalence, this is the one, depending on which report you read, there was one report that went out that said there was 4% prevalence in the quarter horse population. There was another report that went out that said there was 29% prevalence in the quarter horse um, population. And again, it has to do with which bloodlines are being looked at. So this disorder is much more prevalent in reigning working cow horse bloodlines and halter horse bloodlines. So depending which um, horses are surveyed, that's part of the reason why you get such a big range um, in the reports that are published. This one is a little different. We've talked about recessive diseases. We've talked about dominant diseases. This is a co-dominant. And that means that it's dominant and that you only need one copy of the gene. Horse only needs one copy of the gene to, so, to show clinical disease, but it is greatly affected by environment. So you can have horses that only have one copy of the gene that never show symptoms. So they never show signs of the disease. Um, and we don't know exactly why yet. Um, there are some things that we know will kind of set it off. Respiratory infections, especially respiratory infections associated with strangles or the strangles vaccine can set off these horses that have this gene. Um, immune stimulants, so there's some different drugs we use to stimulate the immune system. That can cause these horses to have episodes of this muscle wasting and muscle loss. Sometimes just their basic vaccinations, especially those for influenza and equine herpes virus, um, any type of muscle damage. So maybe they uh, get kicked, um, get in a fight with another horse that sets up some swelling, some muscle damage, and suddenly it sets off this just severe muscle wasting of that animal where their immune system is basically attacking their muscle cells. Um, and you have other horses, like I said, that have one copy or two copies of the gene, and you never really see this disease triggered. So this co-dominant means we know there's some other environmental factors and some other genes that play into this that just haven't been discovered yet, um, but we're learning a lot more about it. It's the newest one we're looking at, and the researchers are doing a great job of figuring out some of these triggers. Like I talked about some of the vaccines, um, pigeon fever. We don't have a lot of that in North Dakota, but in the states that have um, frequent infections with coronary bacteria, which causes pigeon fever, that's another one that'll set off this disease. All right, whirlwind tour of all those six diseases. This is kind of the summary slide. We had two that were recessive, meaning the horse has to get a copy from both parents in order for them to be affected. G-bed, Fatal disease, those foals don't survive. Herda, that's the skin disease. Um, not fatal, but again, it makes it difficult for those horses to be performance horses most of the time. And then our other ones, HYPP, MH, malignant hypothermia, PSSM, MYHM, are all dominant diseases. The horse has one copy of the gene. They can get it from either parent. It just takes one um, for them to show clinical signs of the disease. They're not usually fatal, 
although in severe instances, it can lead to death, but a lot of times they can be managed, especially with environment and how we feed them. And so with that whirlwind tour, I'm going to turn it over to Paige to continue on. All right, so we talked about those diseases. Now we're going to talk about where to get a test and how to get your horse tested. The first step is to check with your breed registry. We talked about the quarter horse disease panel and um, often to register your horses, you're going to either want to do this or be required to get a, a DNA test sent in. So if you're going to need to do that anyway, it's best to just go through your breed registry to get that done. And you can go to their website, you can request an online form, and they'll email you the documents that you need, or you can mail in a submission form as well. If you don't need it for registration or for your breed, you can get them directly from university labs. The most common one out there is the University of California at Davis. Their veterinary genetics lab has an option for you to obtain what you need as far as sampling goes and send that sample directly to them and get the results back. You can also utilize some of the private labs that are out there. There's a variety of them. I listed a couple on the screen here. And then the cost really varies from lab to lab. But in general, depending upon what test you're doing or what package of tests you're doing, you're looking at anywhere from $50 to $150 plus to get these results. All right, so next you're going to want to gather the supplies that you need. And uh, gloves are recommended, if, uh, especially if you have sensitive skin, so that hair when you're pulling it can cause cuts into your hand. So gloves can be recommended. Um, a pliers is useful if you don't want to pull it by hand. You'll need that DNA collection form that you obtain through your breed registry or through the lab of your choice. Of course, something to write with tape to secure your hair sample, an envelope, a halter, and a lead rope. As far as the testing goes, we take hair samples to get the results for the test that we talked about today. And you can use mane hair or tail hair on your horse, but if you're testing a foal, the tail hair does uh, is recommended. It seems to work better. You're more likely to get the bulb or the root of that hair. The mane hair is really fine on young foals, so that's not as recommended. If you're testing an older horse or an adult horse, go ahead and test on the, the mane. If you go right above the withers a few inches, that's a good location where the hair is still pretty short, so you're not pulling out long strands of their hair. And if you sample from the underside of the mane, you have a, a less risk of having those hairs stick straight up as they're going back if the appearance is important to you. You're not removing enough hairs to where it's going to, to really be noticeable, but if that's important to you, that's a little tip or a trick to use. When you're testing from the tail, again, you can pick the short hairs near the top and the side of the tail. You can go underneath a little bit so that when they do grow back in, um, they're not quite as noticeable. So the steps for actually getting down and, and pulling that hair. So first, safely restrain the horse. Most horses aren't going to be bothered by this if they're handled regularly and if you're pulling a small amount of hair at a time. Most of these samples are going to request that you submit 20 to 40 hairs that have the root and the bulb attached. So not every hair that you pull out is going to have that portion attached to it. So we do need to kind of look closely and see what the sample looks like. Do your best to select clean hair. So if you have mud or dirt or manure on the hair, try to avoid those areas. Pick the clean area if you can. And then if you grab 10 or fewer hairs at a time, again, your horse isn't likely to notice it as much. Just when you try to grasp 40, 50 hairs at once and pull, you'll end up pulling on the skin and that can cause a little discomfort. So the fewer amount of hairs that you pull out at once, it'll be easiest on you and your horse. So wrap them around your finger or grab them with the pliers, pull quickly and firmly, and hairs will come right on out. 
once you have them, inspect them. So take a look in the picture here. It can be a little hard to see, but at the end of those hair samples is the, the bulb or the root of the hair that we're looking for. And it's key that that's on there. And that's another reason why you don't just go with a scissors and cut a piece of hair off. You need to pull to get that bulb from uh, to come out with the hair. After you do that, you go ahead and tape that hair onto the sample form. After you double check that the hair that you're pulling is going on the correct identification form. So especially if you're going down the line and you're registering a bunch of foals or you're sampling from multiple horses, make sure that you're identifying those samples correctly and keeping them separate. I always recommend that you pull more hair than you need, uh, put it in an envelope, make sure that you can inspect those hairs closely and submit the required amount to the lab, 20 to 40 hairs with the bulb attached. Keep that extra hair on file. So put it in a, a plain white envelope, label it with the horse's name or the identifier, sire and dam of that foal, um, the date that you collected it, and put it in your files or your records. That way, if you need it, if it got lost in the mail, you have another sample that you could quickly and easily send in. Go ahead and once you mail it to the lab, a lot of times um, the turnaround time varies, of course, but on average, it seems to be about two weeks for most labs. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Mary to give a little summary. Okay. Let me get back on the slides here. Here we go. So I I was listening the whole time and as I was listening to Carrie talk about the diseases and, and the things that happen sometimes and then um, Paige about the sampling, all I thought was, man, these folks are gritty. You, the horse owners are just gritty people. Kudos to you. I just have a pony. I'm not sure if that counts as a horse, but anyways. Um, so today we talked about uh, genetic basics. And so I know some of you are probably hoping to get into the, the real meat and potatoes of each one and how you can help your horse specifically. But of course, with um, 35 to 40 of you on here, we can't touch every specific situation. However, reaching out to your local veterinarian, whomever it is that you're working with, um, with that disease uh, is very important. Um, AQHA has um, six diseases that you're looking at with the genetic disease panel. And then, of course, Paige covered, how do we take that sample and submit it? And where can we submit those to? And so with that, um, as we wrap up today, we do have some time for questions. And so there's a couple that we've answered along the way. Um, there's a couple that we've typed answers to that I'm gonna read. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, if you have questions, you can drop them now into the Q&A, into the chat box. Um, and actually, I think you should be able to unmute if, if you want to as well. I think you can request that. So we'll stop sharing and we'll go through a couple questions here. So one of the questions was, um, what's the youngest age or generally accepted age to test DNA? And so Paige answered that question, but I'll just read it for those of you who aren't reading the chat. You can test them as young foals and some breed registries require testing before um, issuing registration papers for your foals. And so um, typically when they're young, you can do that. Let's see, there was another question here. Um, is there any way we can print the summary slide of Carrie's um, deck? Um, and so she talked about she has that last slide that has the diseases and what they affect and if they're terminal or not. And so um, when you guys get the follow up email that has the link to the recording, so it'll be a couple days, we need to process the video first, um, then you'll also get those slides. And so then you can print it from there. Um, there is a question here. And I'm going to hand this, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to hand it over. Uh, so any information about trying to establish the stud of a foal? My situation is this. I purchased a mare. She was bred to the previous owners. Um, bred. The previous owner state she couldn't have been bred, but she was. Um, so trying to establish a stud. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I can I can take that. I'd say contact the breed registry, especially if your mare is registered, they'll have that on file. If you're trying to get the foal registered, you can submit the DNA sample from the foal. If you uh, can narrow down the potential sires of that foal, it's much easier to get an answer. Um, so definitely check with your breed registry and, and hopefully you'll have some optimistic news that way. Very good. Rachel, did you have a couple of questions, I think, too, in the Q&A? 
Yep, I was just looking at the Q&A and it looks like um, as pertaining to Herda, is would there be any way that that a sore can form from vigorous rolling if the horse is, is uh, genetically predisposed to that? They can, yeah. Um, anything, even some of the horses severely affected, just the act of pinching their skin um, can lead to a sore as that fills in with fluid and sloughs that skin. So yeah, if those horses are rolling around, and that's one of the reasons if they are really severely affected like that, that they get euthanized because it's just very difficult to keep those horses pain free and keep those sores treated. Um, but again, not all. So there are definitely horses that have herda that can roll and be ridden. Um, it's just that is less common um, and they still need kind of some extra care usually. Um, so yeah, if, if a horse is rolling and getting sores, it doesn't mean that the horse has herda, but definitely there needs to be looked at the reason why um, horses are getting sores if they're just rolling what we would think would be kind of normal, normal vigorous rolling. Okay. And the next one we have, um, HYPP is the disease that they're referring to. Is that restricted to quarter horses only, or is this something that affects other breeds as well? So HYPP is restricted, um, to quarter horses or quarter horse crosses, anything that impressive that stallion would have been um, bred to. So paint horses, Appaloosas definitely would have the opportunity for HYPP. It would be odd to see it in, like you wouldn't see it in a purebred Arabian or a purebred draft horse. Um, but if somewhere that that wasn't a purebred animal and there was some crossing of lines, then potentially it could show up somewhere else. Okay, very good. I should um, maybe just as a quick comment, um, the one of the things about genetic diseases, right? These horses either get the genes or they don't. So even if you have a horse that doesn't show, maybe it's positive for HYPP, but it's not very severe, you can't just like, breed it out of it. Or, you know, since the horse isn't severely affected, it doesn't really have the disease. It either has the gene or it doesn't. And the same thing, you know, a horse can be a descendant of impressive. If it doesn't have the gene, it's never going to get it. It's not going to show up 10 years later. It doesn't have it. So that's the nice thing. These are very clean. They either have the gene or they don't. It's very easy to test and you know one way or the other. Very good. Okay, um, I have one uh, one last poll up. So I'm you guys are answering as we're going along here. Um, any final questions, thoughts to share? Okay, um, so this is it. This is it until probably 2025. Uh, we super appreciate you guys being here. Um, it, if you have questions throughout the year, send them to us. Um, when you guys send them to me, I forward them on to whomever the proper person is. And so if you can't remember everybody's emails, um, you'll certainly have mine after I send the summary out. So go ahead and get in touch with us when you have questions. Uh, we'd like to hear from you uh, throughout the year. So with that, thank you guys so much for joining us. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.